is whatever it takes to conform Job to Jesus Christ, to that image. Whatever. Or Clendenin, or Jerome, or whoever. Whatever that needed. For Paul, it took a messenger of Satan. For Joseph, it took a drip, trip to an Egyptian jail. Amen. All of this in God supplying the need. And we'll discover one day how merciful he was. No wonder he said, through much tribulation we enter into the kingdom. That's not the great tribulation. That's not God's wrath poured out on us. But that is the squeezing. God puts the gospel, the life on the inside. And he puts the pressure on the outside. And there isn't any other way that it can work. No other way that it can work. Now, God had chosen them. He allowed them to go through uh, the, the series of slavery and oppression. Then in a series of great wonders, he proves himself to be the conqueror of all of their enemies. And then in the blood of the Paschal Lamb on their doors now, teaches them what redemption is. Not only from the unjust oppressor upon this earth, but from the righteous judgment that their own sins deserved. God teaches them there. They are no better than the Egyptians as far as their sins. They, 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 if it had not been for that blood, then the firstborn of Egypt dies also. The firstborn of Israel dies also. Without that blood on the door, amen. I know it's, you know, it's a difficult, you know, when we say I'm a sinner saved by grace, and I heard a man go to great lengths say, I'm not a sinner, uh, you know, but it's simply because he wasn't understanding what's being said here. If there is no blood on that door, when that death angel passed through Egypt, then that Jewish baby will die. The firstborn of every animal in that house will die. Everything will die and lift his blood there. But they learned about redemption that night, not only from the hand of a cruel earthly uh, uh, tyrant, but also deliverance from their own sins for which they ought to have died. That blood, they are learning. You see what I'm saying? Amen. That you and I, we learn about this holiness in redemption. Amen. God shows them. Now the Passover is to be to them at all time the transition from the seen and the temporal to the unseen and the spiritual. That's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to minister this, revealing God not only as the mighty, but as the Holy One, freeing them uh, not only from the house of bondage, but from the destroying angel of death that's passing through that night. This is moving from the seen to the unseen, from the temporal to the spiritual. That's the whole of it. That's what happened at Calvary. When Jesus said it's finished, it literally means it's perfected. And man can move now from the temporal to the spiritual, from the seen to the unseen, to what we were speaking of a moment ago. We are pilgrims and strangers here. What we look at in that world out there and deem good may not be good at all, folks, when it's the overall picture. That has to grip our minds or else we're always governed by the world about us. Amen. I, I just never had the revelation of Romans 8, 29 until recently. I knew it said all things work together for good to them that love God. Amen. I realize now whatever it is, the, the tight money policy, the hard time policy, the, the, the difficulties, every single thing that comes and touches my life as I walk with God is good for me. I do not have an enemy on this earth. Paul, three times he prayed, God, get this thing off of my back. Amen. But God said to him, my grace is sufficient. I have supplied you with that messenger of darkness. Amen. Else you would be exalted and be lost. So all the time in the jails, fighting the beasts of Ephesus, all of it is a part of it to keep the man sanctified so they can write over half of the New Testament Scripture. Boy, that doesn't fit today's theology, does it? My, my, that sure doesn't fit in with today's theology. 
That isn't the way it's said, but that's the way it is anyway. Amen. Now, having thus redeemed them through that Passover, he tells them that they are now what? His own. He bought them. He brought them out. Moses didn't. God brought them out. What does he say to them? You are mine. The firstborn is mine. That just meant the people are mine. Said the firstborn of every animal out there is mine. That meant everything you got is mine. He said, the firstborn of an ass, you'll either redeem it or break its neck. That's because everything is mine. I bought you. You still belong to that Pharaoh down there, the devil. You never got out. You'd be making bricks for him from now on. But I brought you out. And when he brought them out, redeemed them, he said to them, you're mine. That needs to be drove home to us because we live like we are our own. I said, we live like we are our own, that our time is ours, that our money is ours, and what we do is of no business to God. But if you're saved this morning, you belong to God. If you're not saved, you belong to the devil, and you're doing what he tells you to do. I mean, you, your whole life is being steered by him. Or else, if you're God's, then he says, you're my own. Now, during their stay at Sinai in the wilderness... The thought is continually pressed upon them that there are now the Lord's people. You go read that account again, and you'll see how much he pressed this upon that brain, that they are now the Lord's people, whom he's made his own by the strength of his arm, that he may take them and make them holy for himself, and as the Scripture said, even as he is holy. Not a different kind of holiness, but they are to be holy as he is holy. God took them to himself. Now, he took possession of it. Amen. He, he, uh, he, he blessed it the seventh day because he got into it. Now, he's brought them out, redeemed them. They're the Lord's. They're his possession. And over and over again, God reminds them that they are to be holy as he is holy. Now, the purpose of redemption is possession, and the purpose of possession is the likeness to him who is redeemer and owner, his holiness. He possesses them to make them into his own image. The same holiness that is in God must be found in us. Amen. Now, in regards to his holiness and the way it is to be obtained, as a result of redemption, there is more than one lesson the sanctifying firstborn, I believe, will teach us. As we look at Israel, the sanctifying... Now, first of all, you and I want to realize how inseparable redemption and holiness are. We have some kind of a grotesque creature that we want to call Christian today uh, that is supposed to be saved yet goes on serving the devil, hasn't made Christ its Lord yet. Now, we, we, we've really led ourselves to believe that such a thing is possible. But let me remind you this morning that the narrow gate doesn't happen ten years down the road. That's where you get in at. Holiness and redemption are inseparable. You cannot separate the two. Neither can exist without the other. You cannot have redemption without holiness, and you certainly cannot have holiness without redemption. Is that right? There's no way that that can be. Only redemption leads to holiness. If I'm seeking holiness, I must abide in the clear and full experience of being a redeemed person, and as such of being owned and possessed by God. I must ever remind myself that I am owned by another. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price from the hand of the devil, and I'm not my own. And as I seek after holiness, I must remember this. Redemption is too often looked at from its negative side as deliverance from, but its real glory is the positive element of being redeemed unto himself. You know the reason we have trouble uh, in our flesh 
with a message of self-denial as a repugnant thing to the uh, to the carnal nature but you know when I realize that self-denial is simply my turning loose of the lesser that I may have the greater there's no other grounds that I can have it on amen I must decrease if God is to increase and the loosing of the lesser is only to gain the fuller full possession of a house means occupation doesn't it that means occupation yes sir if I own a house without occupying it it may be the home of all that's evil and foul I, I at one time when I came here I bought a little house the Downey Brothers uh, had a model they sold it to me for three thousand dollars had a little lot I moved it on and we lived there we built us a house but I still for a long time owned that little house and I rented it to a fella and I'm telling you when I finally threw him out I had to pull a carpet up and throw it out you never saw such a foul spirit been in that house amen if I own a house and don't occupy that house that house can be full with all kinds of foul and evil spirit. Is that right? God has redeemed me, made me his own with a viewing of getting complete possession of me, of occupying me, you. Is that right? Amen. A possession. He says of my soul, it is mine. And he seeks to have his right of ownership acknowledged and made fully manifest by every last one of us. Now that'll be perfect holiness where God has entered in to complete the entire possession. When all has been dealt with and moved and God has total possession, that will be perfect holiness. It is, it is redemption and in redemption, uh, it, and it is redemption rather, that gives God his right and power over me. You know, it's, a, it's something when we act like we've done God a favor by letting him save us. And that's our attitude. You, you listen to testimony of some folks. I've been those uh, that's run on testimony. And you hear them talk about all the money they've got and what a favor they've done God by letting him, by coming into his kingdom. Before I was saved, I was a slave to the devil. You couldn't have told me that while I was out there. But the minute I got in that altar, I knew I was. The minute I took that pack of cigarettes out of my pocket, I knew because I put them back in there. Amen. I fought darkness and demons and still fighting a uh, hold that he's got in pocket areas of our lives. Is that right? A guerrilla warfare going on all the time. Amen. Inside of pockets and areas of that rotten world that we've been redeemed from. Amen. If we just realize that it is in, in redemption that God's right of ownership comes because he bought you back from the devil. He bought you. He paid a price for you. That means he owns you. It is redemption that sets me free for God now to possess and bless. Is that right? It, it is redemption realized and filling my soul and spirit that will bring me the assurance an experience of all his power will work in me. The reason that you and I, as a church, do not perform as Jesus performed is just one reason. That's because we are not what he was. Sanctification, the process of it, is to make us what he was. And to the degree that we're made what he was, we'll do what he did. Because what he did didn't come out of merely what he said. It was out of what he was. Anybody could repeat his sermons. Why, those preachers in the ninth chapter of Mark couldn't cast that devil out. They tried. They saw him do it. I'm sure they went through the same routine he did. Yes, sir. Come out. But he didn't come out. So it wasn't words. It's what he was. When they stood there as Christ, the devil come out. When they said, why couldn't we cast this one out? In that question was, we did it before, why can't we do it now? Because you lost something. That's what he was saying. 
You're trying to do it in your own name. Your own name. In God, redemption and sanctification are one. Oh, if you don't hear nothing else this morning, hear that. In God, redemption and sanctification are one. Amen. Redemption is sanctification begun. The sanctifier comes in. But in, re in sanctification, then regeneration is continued until one day I wake in his likeness. Oh, hallelujah. My, my, that's the excitement of Christianity. Thank God one day awaken his likeness. Amen. The more redemption as a divine reality possesses me, the closer I'm linked to the Redeemer God, the Holy One. The more that redemption possesses me, and that's the process of sanctification, then the closer I come to the Holy One. And just so, only holiness brings the assurance and enjoyment of redemption. Only holiness does that. If I'm seeking to hold fast redemption on the lower ground or lower level, oh my, I may be deceived. Probably will be if I'm trying to hold it there. Amen. If I become unwatchful or careless, I ought to tremble at the idea of trusting in redemption apart from holiness as its object. There ought to be a great fear to take a hold of us. Just coming to church on a Sunday morning isn't going to make it, folks. I must have the end results of redemption must be holiness. Amen. Set apart under God, which just simply means possessed by God. God entered into that Sabbath. He sanctified it. God enters into me. He sanctifies me. And the whole process is to possess you. Amen. Possess you. Make you totally, absolutely his own. Amen. Oh my, if we could know. <clears throat> to God, to Israel rather, God said, I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall be holy for I am holy. It is God, the Redeemer, who made us his own, who calls us to be holy. Let holiness be to us the most essential and the most precious thing of redemption. I said one thing we must repent of. We have made happiness a greater criteria than holiness. We've been more concerned about being happy than we have about being holy. Amen. A second thing that I believe, a lesson rather, that's suggested in, in the connection between God and man's working in sanctification. Listen, to, to Moses, the Lord speaks. Sanctify unto me all the firstborn. Afterward, he says, I sanctified all the firstborn for myself. Now, what, what God does, he does to be carried out and appropriated through us. God said to Moses, sanctify the firstborn unto me. But he said, I have sanctified the firstborn unto myself. That's just saying to you and I, God has sanctified you unto himself, but he leaves it up to you to carry that out. His purpose must be carried out by us. Through our carelessness, we can lose it, or else we can have it. Amen. When he tells us that we're made holy in Christ Jesus, that we're his holy ones, he speaks not only of his purpose, but what he's really done. That's not only, as far as God is concerned, that's what he's done. We've been sanctified in the one offering of Christ, or we'll never be sanctified at all. We have been sanctified in the one offering of Christ, and in our being created anew in Christ Jesus. Amen. But this work has a human side. Do you believe that? I said this work has a human side. To us comes the call to be holy. God said we're made holy in Christ, but then becomes a call to be holy, to follow after holiness, to perfect holiness. This is all a part of it from our side. When God sees us in Christ, then God reckons the, the experience of Christ to be ours. And as we abide there, that's the sole thing we must do, as we abide there, then God works it out. Hallelujah. How marvelous that is. Thank God. 
is, is, he says, I sanctified all to myself. You and I must do it. God has made us his own. He's allowed us to say that we're his. But he awaits for you and I now to yield him an enlarged entrance into the secrets of our inmost being. Amen. You know, it's a marvelous thing that even in your imperfect state, that God allows us to say to the world, I'm God's and God is mine. But on those grounds of letting us say that, God is waiting for us to open ourselves up for the greater work of holiness in our lives, that he can possess it totally and absolutely. He's made us his own in sanctification or in redemption that he might make himself our own in sanctification. Amen. This is God's way. Our work in becoming holy is the bringing of our whole life, every part of us, leaving not one hoof behind. Amen. No, no, not one hoof behind, but the whole of it into that act and subjection to the rule of a holy God. And that's exactly what he meant when he said, Seek you first the kingdom of God. That is to seek the absolute rule of God over every part of our life the whole of our being. It does not matter. Amen. Nothing is to be left on the outside unsanctified. All is to be brought in. It doesn't matter. You know, I, I believe if my job won't allow me to be holy and live for God, then I must change that job. Yes, sir. I cannot be governed by this world or anything by it. Why? Because I don't belong to this world. I have been bought I have been bought. Amen. You know, you, you own something. You, you, you are the one that governed. Had a fellow in the church here years ago. And, you know, I'd been here and I had an old Nash. At first, I'd have been better off with a bicycle. A fellow had run into the side of couldn't get out on my side. Had to push it every morning uh, to get it started. And, and I go visit folks, had to leave it running out in a drive because I couldn't get it going. And we struggled for years, you know, with all kinds of uh, uh, machines. Finally, in 1962, amen, I got up enough faith and courage and I bought me a new car, a 1962 Buick LeSabre, amen. And a guy come to me and he said, we're going on a vacation and our car don't have an air condition. And he said, one of you would let us have yours. <laughs> I said, I don't believe. I don't want to be ugly. But I said, I've sanctified this car <laughs> to the Lord, and I don't believe that I did. He got angry with me, but I still didn't believe that I'd done wrong. I mean, if he had needed it uh, for uh, emergency or something, that'd have been one thing. I'm just saying that is I own that car. Therefore, I have the right to tell him whether he could or could not have that car or anybody else for that matter. Well, God bought me. He owns me. And he has every right, every right to tell Bob Fontaine where he can go, what he can do, what he can't do. God has every right. If you don't allow him to do that, you are violating the terms on which you were redeemed on. You're violating them. And one day you'll have to answer to him, amen, about all this. He, he, he bought us. Now, our work in becoming, as I said, bring the whole body, the whole life in absolute subjection. And this teaches us the answer to the question as to the connection between the sudden and the gradual sanctification. Now, between it being a thing once for all complete and yet imperfect and needing to be perfected. Isn't that right? I mean, on God's side, it's once and all finished. If you stay with God, it's as sure to happen as that sun comes up. So with God, it's an absolute thing. But with me, there's a lot of working out to be done on my side. So you have the absolute sudden eradication. The Bible says in the book of Romans, they that are Christ, have crucified the flesh. Is that what it says? But yet it says to you to mortify those things. You see, I believe that answers the question. It does to my heart in, in explaining 
some of the greatest folks I know have an instantaneous sanctification. I discovered they're right. Amen. But they, you know, uh, uh, but they must discover also that I'm right in the progressiveness of it. Because on God's side, it's an instant. When you was born again, God looked at you. There was a, there was a finished product on God's side. And if you stay with Him, then the working of that in you brings you to that fullness. Hallelujah. Amen. God's side of it. When God sanctifies, what God sanctifies is holy with a divine and perfect holiness as his gift. Man has to sanctify by acknowledging and maintaining and carrying out that holiness in relation to what God has made holy. Man has to do that. God sanctified the Sabbath day. Man has to sanctify it. That is to keep it holy. Man had to. Amen. God sanctified the firstborn of his own. Israel had to sanctify them to treat them and give them up to God as holy. He sanctified them. But Israel, when that first calf was dropped, had to take it and give it to God. You and I, he sanctified us holy. But I must give him everything about me. I believe that ought to clear it in our minds as to sanctification and holiness and redemption. God is holy. We're to sanctify him in acknowledging and adoring and honoring that holiness. God has sanctified his great name. His name is holy. Now we sanctify a hell of that name as we fear and trust and use it as the revelation of his holiness. We sanctify it. Hallelujah. That's the only way it works. God sanctified Christ. God did. Christ sanctified himself, manifesting in his personal will and action perfect conformity to the holiness which, which God had made him holy. Christ as a man. Amen. God has sanctified us in Christ Jesus. We're to be holy by yielding ourselves to the power of that holiness, by acting it out and manifesting it in all of our life and walk. All of it. The objective divine gift bestowed once for all completely must be appropriated by you and I to fulfill the purpose of God. On God's side, it's a finished work. On our side, it's a lifetime of yielding ourselves to him who makes holy. Hallelujah. Sanctified or made holy in Christ is the most marvelous statement and to realize that we're called for this thing, to be holy. We are called to be holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy, is the very call of God upon our lives. Let's lift our hands and love him and thank him for being here today. Chapter 3. And when the Lord saw that Moses turned aside to see, he called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. But you notice there, put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Why was it holy ground? We have just come through the message dealing with the Sabbath. God sanctified it. That's the only time in the entire book of Genesis that the word holy is used. God sanctified the Sabbath by resting in it, by being in it, by God getting in it. Now we have holy ground. Why was it holy? Because God had come and occupied that ground. There's no other grounds of holiness, folks, except God has come and occupied that ground. God has come there and occupied. Where God is, there is holiness. In the presence of God, there's holiness. Wherever God's presence is, that place is holy. If God lives in you and I, 
we are holy. We sometimes don't act holy, but we are holy. God sees us in Christ. That doesn't make any excuse for us. We must become what God sees us to be, or else we'll be rejected of God. But the Holy Ghost has put us in Christ, in Christ in us, and God sees us in Christ and reckons that the experience of Christ is our experience. So if God is in you, you're holy. That's the reason Paul said, I will that men everywhere lift up holy hands unto God. Those hands are only holy that are attached to a people in whom God is. And so wherever God is, He makes it holy. Now this is the truth we met in paradise when man was created. This is, this, here's where the Scripture used the word holy for the second time. It is repeated and enforced. Amen. This is the second time this word is used. And it's repeated and enforced and in the exact circumstances. That is, it is only the presence of God that makes holy. I must abide in that. I must walk in that. That holiness will work itself out of me in an external manner. If it doesn't, it's not in there. It's one thing to say that God's in you. It's another thing for God to be in you. And if God is in us, then that holiness that is there because of God will certainly find itself on the outside. Men will know. They'll be able to take note of us that we are holy. What they may not recognize the term, but they'll know that we've been with God. Now, careful study of the word holy in the light of the burning bush, I believe, will further deepen the significance. I want us to see what uh, the history, what sacred history, what the revelation of God, and what Moses teaches us of this holy ground. This morning, I, if I give it a, a title, I'd title it Holiness and Revelation. Holiness and Revelation. Now, first of all, I want you to notice uh, the place, this first direct revelation of God to man as the Holy One takes in, in, in sacred history. This is the first personal, direct revelation of God to man as such. Now, in, in our lesson last in Paradise, we found the word holy used of the seventh day, the Sabbath day. Since that time, 25 centuries, or 26 centuries, uh, about, have, 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 have elapsed. We found in God's sanctifying the day of rest a promise of a new dispensation. A promise. The revelation of the Almighty to be followed by that of the Holy One making holy. All of this we, uh, we find. The revelation of God Almighty to be followed by that. And yet throughout the book of Genesis, the word never occurs again. Only the one time. It never occurs, but he sanctified the Sabbath. Now, it is as if God's holiness is held in abeyance. It's not mentioned again. First, there that we read in the book of Genesis, then it's not mentioned again. It's as if it's been held only in Exodus. With the calling of Moses, does it make its appearance again? Do we run upon this most awesome word, holy? The attribute of God that's spoken of more than any other, more than His love, more than His justice, more than anything else, this holiness of God is brought out in the Bible. But from Genesis 3 to Exodus, you don't find it. Now, this is, this is a fact, I believe, of great importance. Just as a parent or teacher seek in early childhood to impress one lesson at a time, so God deals in the education of the human race. And if you're going to make any study of the Bible, I mean any given subject of the Bible, then you ought to study thoroughly the first five chapters of the book of Genesis and find the beginning of whatever you're going to study. For you will find in the beginning, and the principle never deviates. It develops, enlarges, and matures. But the principles are all there. And you should find it in the beginning, before you begin. So here it is, God, as He's going to impress His student 
and the whole of the human race, he comes to him in the early stages with this word, holy. After having in the flood exhibit his righteous judgment against sin, he calls Abraham to be the father of a chosen people. And as a foundation of all his dealings with that people, he teaches him and is seed, first of all, the lesson of childlike trust. This is, this is the, the lesson that he's instilling into all of God's people from Abraham onward. He is the father of the faithful. And God, through Abraham, is teaching his people the lesson of a childlike trust. That is, to just put our trust in God, just like that baby uh, that, of, of the parents believes and trusts that parents for everything. It just rests its case with that parent. I mean, everything is just cast upon that parent to provide a home, food. It doesn't worry about those things. It just implicitly trusts that when time comes to eat something, when it gets hungry, there's going to be something to eat. And through Abraham, God has given us trust in Him as the Almighty, with whom nothing is too wonderful, and trust in His, Him as a faithful one whose oath could never be broken. This He's teaching. He laid that word holy right in the door of the Bible. And after the flood, when he showed his judgment, he called Abraham, and he teaches uh, through Abraham this uh, lesson of trust in God, of, of a God who was faithful, that loved us, that would keep his promise, that his, he, his promises could not be broken. But with the growth of Israel to a people, we see the revelation advancing now to a new stage. What is happening? The simplicity of childhood is gives away to the waywardness of youth, and God must now interfere with the discipline and the restriction of law. We're coming from that childlike trust to Israel as she develops into the wayward youth that usually works out then God interferes into that life with the strictness and the interference of law into that downward trend. God is, is dealing with it. Having gained a right to a place in their confidence as a God to their fathers, He prepares them then for the further revelation of the God of Abraham. The chief attribute was that He was the Almighty One. He appeared to Abraham as El Shaddai the Provider, the Almighty One of the God of Israel, of Jehovah, that He is the Holy One. Hallelujah. He is the Holy One. And more than anything else, He must be recognized as this. It isn't difficult uh, to recognize Him as the Almighty One. I think sometimes that Faber was right when he said that science perhaps uh, has a more awesome God than the Christian church. Now, and he further qualified that statement by saying that science of his day and some of ours recognize that there is above all this a supreme being. And they recognize, they have tracked him in the millenniums of the life of that God, into the Father's reaching stars, talking about thousands of light years. They've tracked Him. They've saw Him. They've been awed by the infinite uh, eternity of God, while the average theologian, when he studies eternal and eternity, never links it with the object of his worship. Isn't that true? So in, in reality, they do worship a, a more awesome God than the average Christian. But they reckon, I just said that to say, that men recognize Him as the Almighty. But He developed in, to be Jehovah, the Holy One. And what He is to be the special mark of the new period that is now about to be inaugurated, what is the special mark of that, which is to be introduced by this word, Holy Holy, holy in Christ, holy. God tells Moses that he is now about to reveal himself in a new character. 
He's known to Abraham as God Almighty, the God of promise. He would now manifest himself as Jehovah, the God of fulfillment, especially in the redemption and deliverance of his people from the oppression he had foretold to Abraham. He will, he will be that. God Almighty is a God of creation. Abraham believed in God, the God who quickeneth the dead. Amen. And calleth the things that are not as though they already were. Abraham believed in that God. He knew that God. And the lesson that Abraham taught us is that if we will in childlike simplicity trust that God, then all will work out. You know, if we just trust Him as we should, uh, one great preacher said, if I ask God for something and I seek Him earnestly and I don't get it, it must mean that I didn't need it. It must mean that it didn't need it. That's the trust. Amen. Jehovah is a God of redemption and holiness. Now, with Abraham, there was not one word of sin or guilt, and therefore not of redemption or of holiness. Not one word to Abraham. Do you have anything brought about of sin or guilt? Therefore, if these are not a part of the vocabulary, then there is no need for the other words, redemption or holiness. Is that right? You know, there, there'll be no need for the words redemption. And with Abraham during the entire time, there is no word of sin or, 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 or guilt. Now, to Israel, the law is to be given to, give, to convince of sin and prepare the way for holiness. Paul said... Before the law, there was no knowledge of sin. By the law. That's the reason the law has to be preached. No man can keep the law and be saved. You're not saved by keeping the law. But you're never going to have any real conversions until the law is preached. A man must be made to know he's a sinner. It's, a, it's, it's parasitism for a person just to come and somebody tell them, now you just repeat after me a little prayer. <laughs> and they just uh, say, I accept Jesus as my Savior, and have never come to realize that they are a sinner. And that's what happens to most folks. That's the reason you don't find them. Or if you do keep them, you keep them just by a lot of religious hot water. person born again, you know, a person born again, uh, there, there's a struggle to, to be kept, not somebody struggling to keep him. Is that right? You know, a baby's born... And that baby is born with a will to live. Listen, a little old baby has within it the struggle to live. You let sickness take hold of a baby just born. And there he is in that baby, amen, an innate desire to live, to battle for life. And a person really born again, there is that desire. You know, I, 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 I was thinking along this line and this lesson... And the thought came to me, you know, when I first, my soul was first awakened to its need of, of a Savior. When my spirit was first aroused to the need, then my anxiety was born out of knowing how. How am I going to get in to that new environment? How am I going to get into it? That that become the anxiety, wasn't it? If, if you had any interim between the time you were saved and, and, and the time that God stirred you up and you were saved, if it was just a matter of hours, then there was this anxiety. How am I going to get there? But then the moment you get there, the anxiety is reversed. The Bible tells us that the way in is we pass from death unto life. That's the way in, isn't it? But the moment you get in there, then the, the whole system is reversed. Now that I'm here, how am I going to break with the old environment? And the whole thing is reversed. From there you pass from life unto death. You know, from life unto death. Without the law, there is no knowledge of sin. The man doesn't know that he's dead and has to be made alive. So all he does 
is just through somebody's little conversation says, I take Jesus to be my personal Savior. But being born again is a sight more than that. I'm not saying that some folks haven't been born again at that point. I'm saying for the most part, it's not because that's the reason you never see them again. They weren't born again. So, to Israel the law is given to convince of sin. It is Jehovah, the Holy One of Israel, the Redeemer, who now appears, and it is the presence of this Holy One that makes that ground holy. God is there. Roland Buck said that is his cryony in that bush. But this book said it was God. No angel ever made ground holy. Only God makes ground holy. Amen. God makes it. But the second thing, how does this presence reveal itself? In the burning bush, God makes himself known as dwelling in the midst of what? The fire. Dwelling in the midst of the fire. Elsewhere in the Scripture, the connection between fire and the holiness of God is clearly expressed. The light of Israel shall be for a fire, and the Holy One for a flame. For a flame. The nature of fire may be either beneficial or destructive. It can be either way. My, there's times you'd be dead without fire, isn't that right? Amen. I thought it was going to freeze to death anyway. Amen. Fire can be very beneficial or very destructive. I drove over yesterday by that red carpet and I could not believe what happened to that magnificent structure as it burnt the entire thing out before they could curb it. Just, just something, isn't it? Oh my. The sun, the central fire may give life and fruitfulness or it can scorch to death. It can burn up. All depends upon occupying the right position, upon the relation in which we stand to it. Every bit of it. That sun was out, the earth would be a frigid zone. If there's any closer, they say we'd burn up. It's beneficial. I saw folks that blistered by it, you know, just cooked by it. It'll cause skin cancers on some folks. But you couldn't make it without it. It's all in, in the position that you stand in relationship to it as to whether that sun is beneficial to you or destructive to you. Isn't that right? It's always that way with fire. And so wherever God, the Holy One, reveals Himself, we'll find the two sides. God's holiness, number one, is judgment against sin. When the church really stands in the right place, it reproves the world. Today there's such an un... There's such a compromising with the world that we don't reprove the world. That's the reason the world don't hate us. He said, they, they hate me, they'll hate you. But they're not too much hatred at us like there was at him. You know, the knife is still there, just hid in the world's skirts. And if you and I ever really live in such a way, so, so much of Christ in us, that we reprove them, we'll find, we'll find, their, their hatred is there. And His holiness, wherever it is, is always as judgment against sin, destroying the sinner who remains in it, and as mercy, His holiness always appears as mercy, freeing His people from sin. Glory to God. I'm glad He didn't save us in our sins. He saved us from our sins. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Thank God saved us from our sins. Now, of the elements of nature, there's none of such spiritual and mighty energy as fire. Nothing. You know, to drive them automobiles, you have to ignite and burn that fuel. Amen. That fuel has no energy until it's set afire, until it's exploded, compressed. Then it drives that car. Nothing like fire. What it consumes, it takes and changes into its own spiritual nature. Whatever fire takes a hold of and consumes, that fire changes it into its own spiritual nature. You know, nothing's ever done. It's rejecting as smoke and ashes what cannot be assimilated. Isn't that something? You know what a revelation that is, isn't it? Whatever fire burns, it takes and consumes and changes it into its own nature. And whatever it cannot assimilate, he sends off in smoke and ashes. Fire does that. Fire does that. And so the holiness of God is that infinite perfection 
by which he keeps himself free from all that is not divine, and yet his fellowship with the creature, and takes it up into union with himself, destroying and casting out all that will not give itself to himself. The Holy Ghost will burn up everything that doesn't have the possibility in it to be conformed to Christ, but yet takes all that will conform and makes it into his own likeness. That's the fire of God's holiness burning within us. Amen. All the rest is asked. It is thus as one who dwells in fire, who is a fire, that God reveals himself at the opening of this new redemption period. Amen. With Abraham, the patriarchs, as we said, there's been little teaching about sin or redemption. Very little. Amen. But you know, uh, the nearness and the friendship of God has been revealed. It's a marvelous thing. said Abraham was a friend of God. You know, friend, that's a very wonderful term. Someone said if you find one real true friend in a lifetime, you know, that you, you, you just done good. Well, that's folks out there in the world in sin. That may be true. But the word friend is a marvelous word. God was a friend and called Abraham his friend. So through Abraham and the patriarchs, we have this wonderful teaching of the friendship of God and the, and the nearness of God. You know, God wanting to be uh, a friend with man, amen, wanting to be, the nearness. Now the law will be given, and sin will be made manifest. The distance from God will be felt, that man, in learning to know himself and his sinfulness, may learn to know and long for God to make him holy. Nobody ever longs for that till he knows that he's not that. Nobody ever longs to be changed. You know, alcoholics never are delivered until they're willing to admit that they're alcoholics. And a sinner never longs for holiness until the law makes him know that he's unholy. And then there comes this desire. The revelation of the nearness and the friendship of God in Abraham, nothing, nothing about the sin. But then the law comes, and sin is revealed, and a distance from God is revealed to man by the law. And immediately there's born in that man's heart a desire for that holiness of God. Amen. That has to be, and with it comes the law. Now, in all God's revelation of Himself, we'll find the combination of the two elements, the one repelling and the other attracting. The one repelling. Now, in His house He will dwell in the midst of Israel, yet it will be in the awful, unapproachable solitude and darkness of the holiest of all within the veil. It'll be that way. He'll come near to them, yet keep them at a distance. he come near, but yet keep them at a distance. In all of God's dealing with man, you find that to be so. Amen. He comes near until that object is brought to himself. Now, you know, both of these elements, and as we study as we study uh, the holiness of God, this remarkable character that occupies so much of this book, as we study the holiness of God, we'll see in increasing clearness how like fire it repels and attracts, how it combines into one his infinite distance and his infinite nearness. You know... We sing that chorus, How big is God? And we say, He's big enough to fill this universe, small enough to live within us. You see, even in that song, it comes out. But as we study the holiness of God, we discover that. That in this attribute, how like fire, how, how much like fire, it repels, it attracts, it shows the nearness, yet it shows the distance, both of it. Third, but the distance will be that which comes out first and most strongly. <clears throat> that holiness will show the distance. You see, the law, the law 
revealed how far away from God you really were. The, the, the heresy and the apostasy of the brotherhood of man and the father, fatherhood of God that made every man on this earth a child of God. That, that apostasy blinded man. But the holiness of God, first of all, reveals the distance between God and sinful man. Oh, the awful gulf fixed that man in himself cannot cross. That awful gulf. This we see in Moses. He hid his face, for he feared to look upon God. You see, he knew that distance. He is a fear, afraid to look upon God. The first impression with God's holiness is that of fear and awe. Said of the Romans, in the book of Romans, Paul writing said, There was no fear of God before their eyes. And he had listed all of the terrible things, destruction and misery, were in their way. Their feet were swift to shed blood. The poison of an ass was under their tongue. Why? There was no fear of God. You see, the holiness of God wasn't revealed. It didn't reveal today. There's not any fear much in the church today of God I'm talking about. But the first, first touch of that holiness, the first realization of it, is accompanied by fear and awe of God until man both as a creature and as sinners learns how high God is above him and how different and distant he is from God, the holiness of God will have very little real attraction to him. Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, and he saw himself as a sinful man. He saw the distance between him and God. Whenever he saw God, he saw this. It's always that way. Moses hiding his face shows the effect of the drawing nigh of God, uh, of the Holy One, and the path of his further revelation. He sees it immediately, the path of this revelation. Now, how distinctly and wonderfully this comes out in God's own words. Listen, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet. Oh, God, God, you see, it comes out in his own language. Don't you come up close here. And you take the shoes off your feet. He is confronted with the holiness of God. God is drawn nigh, but Moses cannot. God draws near, but Moses can't draw near in the condition of things at this point. In the same breath, God says, draw nigh but don't draw nigh. In the same breath, God says it to him. There can be no knowledge of God or nearness of God where we have not first heard his draw not nigh. There is no way for that to happen. I must be made to realize there's a distance between me and God before I can ever draw near to God. The sense of sin, of unfitness for God's presence, is the groundwork of true knowledge of God and worship of Him as a Holy One. Put off thy shoes from thy feet. That's the message of God. Put off thy shoes from thy feet. They're never going to draw near to God as long as you think it don't take much to save me. You have that self-righteous attitude about yourself. There is no way. Put off thy shoes from thy feet. Now the shoes are the means of intercourse with the world. The age through which the flesh or nature does its will, moves about, does its work. This is, this is the shoes. And standing upon holy ground, all of this must be put away, all of it. It is with naked feet, naked and stripped of every covenant, that man must bow before a holy God. He must recognize that he has nothing within himself that renders him uh, rightly, the, that gives him the right or the privilege to be there. He must be stripped of everything. He can only be invited there by God on God's condition. Therefore, he said, take your shoes off because there's nothing. You have nothing in you that gives you the right to draw nigh to me. Till man realizes that, then man, man, he moves where angels fear to trod. Religion invites man into God before man ever recognizes his distance from God. That's when he comes and he just gives God permission to save him. There's no brokenness. There's no brokenness. It's just a matter I take Jesus as my personal Savior. 
It is said of animals, any animal, if you, if you change his environment and make his food easy to eat, easy to get, and easy to find, and all before him, immediately degeneration sets up in that animal. So it is in the Christian church. You lower this thing down towards nothing but a little mouthing, and degeneration sets up in the Christian church to where you wind up with something less than God wanted in new creatures. You wind up with something less than God wanted in the new creation. That put off must exercise its condemning power through our entire being, all of us. Amen. Until we come to realize the full extent of its meaning in the great put off the old man and put on the Lord Jesus. Until we come to realize and know what he's saying, put off the old man and put on the Lord Jesus. And what the putting off of the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ is. Oh, what that is. All that is of nature and flesh. All that is of our own doing or willing or working. Our very life must be put off and given to death. If God, as the Holy One, is going to make Himself known to you and I. Yes, sir. That nature of that flesh is going to have to be put off and dealt with every bit of it. Not just, not just some of it. We have seen before that holiness is more than goodness or freedom from sin. Even unfallen nature is not holy. No, sir. Even unfallen nature is not holy. Holiness is that awful glory by which divinity is separated from all that is created. Thank God, all that is created. Amen. Therefore, even the seraphs veil their faces with their wings when they sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Oh, God, impress upon us what it means call to be holy. Not call just to salvation. Call to be holy. Not call just to be happy. Call to be holy. Not call just to go to heaven. Call to be saints. Call to be holy. Hallelujah, hallelujah. All that is of this nature, amen, must go, must go. But oh, when the distance and the difference is not that of the creatures only, but of the sinner, who can express, who can realize the humiliation, the fear, the shame with which we ought to bow, bow before the voice of the holiness of God, of the Holy One of God. Amen, the Holy One. You know, this is one of the most terrible effects of sin that blinds us. We don't know how unholy, how abominable sin and the sinful nature are in the sight of God. That's one of the most frightening things. Amen. I, I was preaching in Duncan, Oklahoma, and I was dealing with self and sin. And, and the church has had a history of problems and troubles and self and fire and preachers. I didn't know that. But I, had, I was preaching with self and sin. And I, I made mention of this fact that we don't know the horrible nature of sin. That's the effects of it. It's so blinded us that we don't realize how abominable sin and the sinful nature is to the holiness of God. And I said, all you've got to do is just look at Calvary and you'll know what God feels about sin and that awful nature. We had a stern. Folks, uh, folks were upset. Amen. Upset because... They didn't consider themselves to be at a distance for God. Re being religious don't make you close to God. It's God in you that makes you close. Amen. God in you. We've lost the power of recognizing the holiness of God. I said we've lost the power of recognizing the holiness of God. Amen. We know not how unholy uh, we are. Heathen philosophy. Is not even the idea of using the word as expressive of the moral character of his God. And losing sight of the glory of God, we've lost the power of knowing what sin is. That's the reason we can treat it so lightly. That's the reason a preacher can preach all the way around it and not even deal with it. 
is because we've lost the power of recognizing what sin is and the effect of sin upon life. And so he can just dodge around it, dodge around it. Never, never really come to grips with it. Now, now God's first work in drawing nigh to us is to make us feel that we may not draw nigh to Him as we are. That's the reason the Bible implicitly says, not only to the sinner don't draw nigh, but He says to you and I, confess your sin. And if you, when you come to this altar, have anything against your brother, He said, don't approach me with that in your heart. You leave your gift on that altar, and you go get it right with your brother, and then you can come back with your shoes off and draw nigh to me. But don't draw nigh to me, having robbed me of what's mine, with harboring bitterness in your heart, all of this rottenness in your spirit. You cannot. You may think you're holy, but you're not. You know if God has a controversy with you on any one point, any one point, then you are unholy. You are unholy. If God has a controversy with you, anywhere, amen, you can't draw nigh as a sinner is or a Christian with things. That there'll have to be a very real and solemn putting off and giving, giving up to death of all that appears most lawful and needful. Not only our shoes are sore with contact with this unholy earth, even our faces must be covered and our eyes closed in the token the eyes of our hearts as we approach Him. All our human wisdom and understanding are incapable of beholding the holiness of God. Incapable of looking upon it. Amen. Absolutely. The first lesson in the school of personal holiness is the fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. The beginning of wisdom. Amen. The first lesson, Thus saith the high and lofty one whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit, contrition, brokenness of spirit, fear and trembling, are God's demand of those who would see his holiness. Who would see his holiness? Moses was to be the first preacher of holiness, of the full communication of God's holiness, to us in Christ. And his first revelation to Moses was the type and the pledge. From Moses' lips, the people of Israel, from his pen, the church of Christ, was to receive the message, Be holy. I am holy. And I make holy. That was to come from the pen of Moses and the lips of Moses, the first preacher of holiness. His preparation for being the messenger of the Holy One was here, where he hid his face because he was afraid to look upon God. We failed, we failed to make men understand what it is. Turn to Exodus chapter 11, and, uh, or chapter 15 rather, verses 11 through 17. Exodus chapter 15 verse 11 through 17. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness? Now li listen to that. Glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. Thou stretcheth out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy has led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in strength under thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestine. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab trembling shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thine arm. They shall be as still as a stone till the people pass over. O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased, thou shalt bring them in 
plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hand have established, thy hands have established. Now we've dealt with holiness in revelation, holiness in redemption, and the whole thing is based on those three words, holy in Christ. We've discovered in our lesson that holiness, that whatever God comes into, is made holy by the presence of God. Not a certain kind of rules or look, but God coming into. God, God sanctified the Sabbath by joining himself to that Sabbath. And it's always this way. Holiness is God. Be ye holy as I am holy, is what God is saying to us. Now today we deal with holiness and glory. In the text that we've read, these words, I think we have another step in the advance in the revelation of the holiness of God. I, I want more than anything God to help us uh, to, to receive these lessons. If he could take a hold of us, if God could bring our minds into what he's trying to say to us through these lessons, that his desire is to make us what he is. Be ye holy as I am holy. Everything else will take care of itself. We saw in the beginning of these lessons that we're called not just merely to salvation, to be saved and to go to heaven, but we're called to be saints, which put another way means we've been called to be holy. The same word translated saint is also translated holy, called to be holy. Now, we have here for the first time holiness predicated of God himself. The first time we saw in our lesson that the first time holiness was mentioned in the Bible and the only time it's mentioned in the book of Genesis was in the book of Genesis chapter 5 where God said he sanctified the Sabbath. That's holy. That's God made holy the Sabbath is what it means. And it's not mentioned again here till the book of Exodus where God at the burning bush appeared unto Moses and told him that the ground that he stood on was holy. And we saw that from Abraham, <coughs> or through Abraham, God was dealing with man on the ground that he was an almighty God and that he could be trusted. He, he encouraged Abraham that he was his friend and that he could trust him. But with Moses, the character of God takes on another very real and most important aspect that is, he dealt with Moses that he was not only almighty and that he could be trusted, but that he was holy. And wherever he was became holy because he was there. And now we see for the first time holiness uh, predicated of God himself. Listen to it. He is glorious in holiness. Glorious in holiness. Now, what a... Tremendous statement that is found here in the book of Exodus. God is glorious in holiness, and it is to the in, 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 is to the dwelling place of His holiness that He's leading His people. You notice thy holy habitation, He His leadership, and His whole working with His people is to lead them into the habitation of his holiness. It is here that God is bringing us. It is only here that God finds glory in our lives, is when that holiness can be a part of us. In other words, the Bible said, they took knowledge that they had been with Christ. They saw God in them. There's no glory but of God and no holiness but of God. And we find here in these two words linked together, glorious in holiness. Now I want us to first note the expression used here, glorious in holiness. Now throughout scriptures we find the glory and holiness of God mentioned together. I've just listed a few of them. Exodus 29, 43 we read, And the tent 
shall be made holy by thy glory. And the tent shall be made holy by thy glory. That glory of the Lord of which we afterward read, that it filled the house. It filled the house. Now, the glory of an object, of a thing, or a person is its in intrinsic worth or excellence. Is that right? Excellence. This is the glory of anything, is its intrinsic worth, worth or excellence. This is what we have. Now, to glorify is to remove everything that could hinder the full revelation of its excellence. That's what it means to glorify, to move out everything and anything that could hinder the, the revelation of its excellence. Now, in the holiness of God, His glory is hidden in that holiness. But in the glory of God, His holiness is manifested. Hallelujah. Oh, my. You see, we're going to see something here, that this glory both manifests what is of God, but it destroys that which is not of God. We're, we're going to see that this glory, no man can see that glory and live. Is that what it says? No man, that means no flesh, can look on that. It destroys whatever is outside of God. But that glory also is what makes us glorious. It also. Amen. So in the holiness of God, His glory is hidden. But in the glory of God, His holiness is manifest. His glory, the revelation of Himself as a holy one, would make the house holy. Thank God. Whenever that glory is revealed, let that glory come into this temple, and this, this makes it holy. When God in Christ came into you, that's what made us holy, holy in Christ. There may be a lot of work to be done on our lives, and there is. There is a lot of knots that God is working out. But the one thing we must remember, if we are in Christ, we are holy, or else the enemy will keep us under a state of condemnation where we can never rise above it, holy in Christ. Whatever Christ comes into, he makes holy. This is what holiness is all about. Is that right? We must understand this. We must grasp this. I am not all that he's going to work out in my life, but as long as I remain in Christ and Christ remains in me, then when God looks at me, he reckons the experience of Christ to be my experience. And he tells me to reckon yourself dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. The Bible says, They that are Christ have crucified the flesh and the lust and the affections thereof. I know we're still wrestling with it on this side, but as far as God is concerned, if we are in Christ and remain there, then all of this is working out. Took him 20 years to get Jacob to Peniel, but he got him there because Jacob had in him what it took to get him there. Amen. Had it in him. So, so we, we see uh, whenever he comes into the house, when his glory is revealed, he'd make the house holy. In the same way, the two are connected in Leviticus 10 and 3, this glorious and holiness. In Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3, he said, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh unto me, and before all the people I will be glorified. You see, through the Bible, holiness and glory are always linked, these two. Yes, sir, sanctified and glorified. Now, the acknowledgement of his holiness in the priest would be the manifestation of his glory to the people you, you, throughout. So, too, in the song uh, 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 of the seraphim, in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3, you remember? There Isaiah said, In the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And the seraphim were singing, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, the whole earth is full of what? His glory. You see, wherever that holy fills the house, the glory is there. Amen. It's always that way. The two of them go together. When God is in us, holiness is there, and the glory of God 
then can be revealed through us. John said, we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld that God. We beheld him. John said, we beheld him. Now, Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. God's glory was in Christ because God's holiness was there. And God made it so that men ought to be able to see God's glory in the church because His holiness is present. Now, God is one who dwelleth in a light that's unapproachable, whom no man has seen or can see. It is a light of the knowledge of the glory of God that He gives into our hearts. Now, the glory is that which can be seen and known of the invisible and unapproachable light. That light itself and the glorious fire of which the light is shining out, that light is always the holiness of God. The holiness of God. There's much more said about His holiness than any other attribute. And there's a sense in which holiness is more than an attribute of God. It is the essentially what He is uh, in all of His being. But we see this. Now, holiness, as I said, is not so much an attribute of God as a comprehensive summary of all of God's perfections. All of God's perfections. Hallelujah. Oh, what, what wonderful God. If we could get a glimpse and know what He's done by coming into our lives, folks. Now, it is on the shore. It was on the seashore of the Red Sea that Israel praises God. Who is like unto thee, O Lord? Who is like unto thee? Glorious in holiness. Glorious in holiness. You see those words? Now, he is the incomparable one. There's nothing that you can compare God to. Nothing but to himself. There's none like him. And wherein has he proved this and revealed the glory of his holiness? With Moses and Horeb, we saw the glory in the fire, in its double aspect of salvation and destruction. We saw that uh, in, in, in the fire there, the double aspect, consuming what could not be purified and purifying what could not be consumed. That's the fire. That's, that's the holiness of God in us. It will consume whatever can be consumed. It'll destroy whatever's in your life that's not of God. The holiness and glory of God in us will destroy that. But it will purify that which cannot be consumed. All oh, the working of God. He talked about that with the Holy Ghost, didn't he? Burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Amen. But that which couldn't be burned up, purifying it. Bringing the dross to the top. Burning it off. Ridding of those things. Amen. There you have the holiness of God revealed in the fire. That both destroys and purifies. Amen. Both destroys and purifies. We see here too in the Song of Moses, Israel sings of judgment and of mercy. In the song, they sing of the judgment of God and the mercy of God. Now, the pillar of fire and the cloud came between the camp of the Egyptians and that of Israel. It moved in. The armies of Israel or, or of Egypt are coming to destroy. In the front of them, there is this uh, insurmountable object called the Red Sea. And the pillar and the fire of God came in between them. It was a cloud and darkness to those uh, who, who uh, had come to destroy. To the Egyptians, that was total darkness. But to Israel, it was light. That's always the way. Paul said it's a savor unto life and a savor unto death. The holiness and the glory of God is always that way, folks. Amen. It destroys, it destroys what is not incorruptible and purifies what is. Amen. 
And that pillar and fire coming between the two camps was light to one, darkness to the other. Thank God. Amen. Oh, my. The two thoughts run together through the whole song. But in the two verses that follow the ascription of holiness, we find the sum of the whole. Thou stretchest out thy right hand. The earth swallowed them. The Lord looked forth upon the host of the Egyptians from the pillar of fire and discomfited them. Now this is the glory of holiness as judgment and destruction of the enemy. That, that is the glory of it in the destruction of all that would hinder and the burning up all that would hinder you and I as being like God and being what God wants us to be. This is the glory of it now. <clears throat> Thou in thy mercy, listen to it, has led them, thy people, which thou hast redeemed, thou hast guided them in thy strength to the habitation of thy holiness. In other words, he said, you're leading us into that safety and habitation of your holiness, your glory. And in there, in there, as we abide there, that's all in Christ today, folks. Amen. And it's in there that this holiness works both ways. It'll destroy in your life what would hinder God's working and will purify that which does. It works both ways. But God's whole leadership is leading us into Christ, into the habitation of His holiness. Now, this is a glorious are the glory of holiness and mercy and redemption. A holiness that not only delivers, but guides to the habitation of holiness where the Holy One is to dwell and be in His people. And we know where that is, in Christ Jesus our Lord. He was in the tabernacle in the holiest of holies. Amen. He was in the pillar and the cloud. But now God is in Christ, and He is in us. As we are in Christ. That's the reason it said, If you abide in me, and my word abide in you, you can ask what you will, and it shall be done. Only on those grounds that we abide in him. Now, in the inspiration of the hour of triumph, it is thus, <coughs> it's early revealed that the great object and fruit of redemption, as God intended to be wrought out by God, is to be his indwelling, that is, God, to live in us. We were secured in salvation that God may live in us. That, that's, that's the whole of redemption. We were secured that the Holy One, he wrought this great work of redemption on us, that he may live in us, and it is his living in us alone that makes us holy. Everything else is filthy rags. It's earthly, it's sensual, it's devilish. No matter what kind of separation you affect, if it's not of the Holy Ghost, if it's not the presence of God in us, that affects that holiness. And so God has wrought us for this end. He worked that work in our lives that He, God, may live in His people. Hallelujah. Now, now as you observe further, as we look, on into this further, how as it is in the redemption of his people that God's holiness, as we, we dealt with this, in the redemption of his people, God's holiness is revealed. So it is in the song of redemption that the personal ascription of holiness to God is found. Amen. Nowhere else. Only. Nothing holy but what God links himself to. And whatever God links himself to is holy. And men better leave it alone. He says of the tithe, the tithe is holy. Touch not that which is holy, he says. The tithe, he said, is mine. It's holy. God set that apart for himself. So immediately, that tenth part off of the top of whatever we make, whatever we have is God's. No matter what men try to put it under a law, out of the law, God said, I claim that. That's mine. And whatever is God's is holy. And whatever is holy, men better leave alone. Terrible things are bound up in dealing with that. Now we know how in Scripture after some striking, special interposition of God as Redeemer, 
the special influence of the Spirit is manifested in some song of praise. Amen. It's remarkable how it is in these outbursts of enthusiasm. Isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, after God has come and touched our lives, even, you know, there we saw when he redeemed Israel, the song broke out. Thank God they began to sing of his mercy, his judgment, his holiness. Well, you know, all the courses we sing, most of them, are born out of redemption. God's touching us. The glory of God being revealed. Amen. And out of it there comes a song of praise that comes forth from the heart of the greatness of God. Oh, but through the Bible, you know, you see it in the song of, of Hannah in Samuel chapter 2, verse 2. There is none holy as the Lord. That's what she began to sing when God began to deal with her. Always in those times uh, when God brings about the victory of redemption, that song breaks out. Amen. The language of the seraphim, again, Isaiah 6, is that a song of adoration, adoring God. In the great day of Israel's deliverance, the song will be, The Lord Jehovah is become my strength in song. Sing unto the Lord, for he's done excellent things. Cry aloud and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Then Mary sings, for he that is, that is mighty has done great things to me, and holy is his name. Amen. It's always that way. Always that way when there's a real visitation from God. Now the book of Revelation reveals a living creatures giving glory and honor and thanks to him that sitteth on the throne and listen to it and they have no rest day and night saying holy 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 is the Lord God the almighty which was which is and which is to come and when the song of Moses and of the lamb is sung by the sea of glass it will be who shall not fear, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou art holy. This is what evokes the song, and the glory. That we glorify him. Why? Because he's holy. Men, men, if all they know is the mightiness of God, then men, when trouble comes, will be afraid to meet him if they're not right. But it's when we see the holiness of God that there is a glorifying of God in our hearts. When we recognize that holiness of God, that's what brings the whispered hush to hearts, makes men realize who they're dealing with. Amen. Thank God. It is a moment of highest inspiration under the fullest manifestation of God's redeeming power that men and women, God's servants, speak of His holiness. Oh my, when our hearts are lifted up, when we see God, two things happen. His holiness, we, they speak of His holiness. Then like Isaiah, in chapter 6 of the book of Isaiah says, Woe is me. We begin to see ourselves in, amen, as how that that side of us outside of God certainly isn't anything worthwhile. In Psalms, we read, Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous. Give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. And again in the book of Psalms, which has with three times repeated, holy, has been called the echo on earth of the three holies of heaven. He said, Let them praise thy great and terrible name. Holy is He. Exalt you the Lord our God and worship at His footstool. Holy is He. Exalt ye the Lord our God and worship in His holy hill. For the Lord our God is holy. Be ye holy as I am holy. Oh my. Not some other kind of holiness, but be ye holy as I am holy. There is not one kind of holiness for God and another holiness for us. The same holiness that causes us to see his holiness, that's himself, makes us holy when he comes to us. When God 
is in us. Hallelujah. Now, it's under the influence of high spiritual elevation and joy that holiness can be fully apprehended or rightly worshipped. That's the reason it gets noisy when people really begin to worship God. I mean, in that point, when the Spirit of God, when there's a high praise being lifted up, then in that point, I can understand why they danced along that Red Sea. Amen. They saw God, the same glory and holiness that saved them, killed the enemy. And with the tambourines and the shout of victory, they, they really were able to apprehend the holiness of God and worship Him. And when they did, they couldn't contain themselves. It still happens, folks. Whether dead religion believes it or not, it'll get all the way into folks' feet. Amen. Oh, my. Just totally beside ourselves. And it's in that place, you know, the sentiment that becomes us as we worship Him that fits us for knowing and worship Him right is the spirit of praise. Is that right? You can't praise God too much. It's in that praise as we worship, as we worship God. Hallelujah. It's in that moment that we really apprehend the holiness and wonder of God. It's praise and, and that, that it sings and shouts for joy in the experience of full salvation. In that praise and shout and songs when we're rejoicing. In, in this glorious and wonderful salvation of God, that he's joined himself to me, and because he has, I'm holy. Now the world can look at me and find the, the flaws and, the, and the, uh, the breaks in it. But thank God when God looks at me, he sees me in Christ by his revelation of his word and the circumstances of life. He allows me to see what's still there that needs to be rid of. And I'll be preaching this morning on how he's provided the cross. In the mystery of that cross unveiled, we see how we deal with those things. We, we are crucified with him. We have been born crucified if we but could know it. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth within me. Then he says in, in Romans chapter 6, then reckon yourselves dead. Amen. Reckon yourself dead. Oh, we need to pray as David did in the book of Psalm. Bind me with cords of love. Don't let me come down off that cross until everything that doesn't please thee is gone. God provided that, you see. But listen, when we find and see these things in us, they're not there to discourage us. They're there to encourage us that God will help us to overcome this. We are holy in Christ. We're not going to be holy when we get everything off of us. We're holy now, or God wouldn't deal. We're holy because he dealt with us and lives in us. And now he wants to deal with all of that, of that old Adamic nature that is unholy. It is not this that we're talking about. Isn't it at odds, at variance? Listen to me. It isn't what we're saying here as we're dealing with what we've just said at variance? Uh, you know, we're, we're saying that as we draw near to God, His glory is revealed and the holiness of God is brought forth and the shout of praise that begins to, uh, to pour forth from my heart. Well, isn't that a kind of a contradiction, somebody says, of what we find at Horeb when Moses is there and the minute God speaks to him, he says, don't draw near here. We just got through talking about drawing near, but he says, uh, draw near. Not near, put off, not now hither. It said, put off the shoes. And the Bible says Moses feared and hid his face. And, and is not this very deed, the posture that becomes us as creatures and sinners? Uh, face bowed, it is indeed. And yet the two sentiments are certainly not at variance or odds one with another. No, rather they're totally indispensable to each other. Amen. The one, the shout of joy and praise. The other, with a bowed head and humble posture. Amen. The fear is the preparation for the praise and the glory. Amen. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. They're indispensable. It is right in approaching Him. Amen. That there's a fear. But the fear is the preparation 
for the praise and the glory. Or it is not the same Moses, is it not, who hid his face from God, amen, but who afterwards beheld God in such a measure that his whole face was shining that the people couldn't look upon him. So you see this godly fear that we find at the bush and the praise that comes out of hearts and drawing near uh, when the recognition of full salvation are indispensable one to the another. The fear is a preparation, amen, that brings it. It's not the song that sings here of God as glorious in holiness as the song of Moses who feared and hid his face. Amen. The song that's sung by him. Have we not seen in the fire and in God and especially in his holiness the twofold aspect, the consuming and the purifying? As we approach God, amen, we, we approach him as Moses with head bowed and fear gripping our hearts, amen, into that glorious presence it consumes all that's not of God. Amen. It is death to what's not of God. That's, that's, that is the one. It burns up the chaff with an unquenchable fire. Oh, I'm glad that he knows how to deal with us. He sees we approach him in that point. But oh, thank God, you know, it, it is this consuming and, and purifying, repelling and attracting, judging and saving, with the latter in each case, not only the accompaniment, but the results of the former. The salvation is a result of all the repelling and the destroying and the consuming. So that it comes out of that, that which is of God. Hallelujah. Oh, thank God. I'll tell you the wonders of God. This great redemption, as we see it's working in us from the day that we're born again until that time, we awaken His likeness. It's always the presence of God. The early disciples of Christianity understood Christianity on one ground, that it was the impartation of life. They understood Christianity. Not a code of ethics or rules, but the impartation of life. Amen. Oh, my. Now, we'll find that the deeper the humbling and the fear in God's holy presence and the more real and complete the putting off of all that is of self and of nature, even to the putting off the complete death of the old man and his will, the more hardy the given up to be consumed of what is sinful, the deeper and fuller will be the praise and the joy with which we sing out of our own song of redemption. The deeper we go into his death, the higher we're going to rise in his resurrection. Amen. Yes, sir. The more we're willing to die to all that's not of him and all that is to ourselves, the more glorious and wonderful will be our song. Listen. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? That's our text. Amen. Glorious in holiness, fearful, in praises. Fearful in praises. The song itself harmonizes the apparently conflicting <coughs> elements. Fear and glory. Rejoicing and fear. Amen. The one God dealing with us. I dealt with a person that had been serving God for 50 years. And it looked like they were going to die. And they were so fearful. So fearful as they approached that moment of death. And yet they'd been Christians for over 50 years. And I, I could not understand as I prayed, don't you believe things are right between you and God? Yes, I believe things are right. Why are you afraid? I don't know. I came back to this church after dealing with them. And as I prayed and sought God, I, He made me to know that that person was a Christian, saved. But they were about to be ushered into the presence of God Almighty, and they had not done all that he had told them to do. Paul said, I have fought the fight, I've kept the faith, I've finished the course. You see, that fear, when I come into God, amen, you and I, that there in us, 
That is in rebellion to God. That's not what God wants. But it is there as that glory burns it up this side of the grave that we rise up then in the glory of His holiness and the praise, the song, amen, fearful in praises. Yes, I'll sing of judgment and I'll sing of mercy. Isn't that what the Bible says? Sing of judgment, sing of mercy. I'll rejoice with trembling as I praise the God who is always holy. Hallelujah. As I look upon the two sides of His holiness as revealed to the Egyptians and to the Israelites, I remember that what was there separated is in me united. I want you to hear me. As you look, here is the Egyptian coming to destroy the Israelite. And that fire and cloud came in between them. And the fire was darkness to one and light to the other. But what was there separated is in you and I united. Both the Egyptian and the Israelite, so to speak, is in us. Time you got. Both is in us. Is that right? The old man and the new man. They're in there, in us. When I see this, by nature I'm the Egyptian, an Egyptian, an, an enemy doomed to destruction. By nature, my cast to die. There isn't any other way. There isn't no shape up, fix up, primp up, die. That's the verdict. Amen. Self has to die. God has no other answer to it. Here, here we're seeing by nature, that is, out of the first Adam, I am an enemy doomed to destruction. By grace, I'm an Israelite chosen for redemption. Thank God. Chosen for redemption. In me, in me, in you, 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 you must, con the fire must consume and destroy. It must. Only as judgment does its work can mercy fully save. Is that right, folks? Only as, as the judgment of God's holiness does its work can the mercy and glory of God's uh, holiness do its full work. There isn't any other way. You see, that fire repels and draws, consumes and purifies. And in us is both the Egyptian and the Israelite. And the same holiness had come to purify and glorify that new creation came to destroy the old man. This is the essence of the whole lesson, folks. The essence. It is only as I tremble before the searching light and the burning fire and the consuming heat of God's holiness, as I yield the Egyptian nature to be judged and condemned and slain, that the Israelite in me will be redeemed and glorified. You hear what I'm saying? Wave your hand. Amen. Only see. I approach him in fear for the destruction of all that's not him. And then out of that comes one that can look on him. Thank God. One that can look on him and in, gl in glorious holiness. Amen. Praise him and adore him. Oh, the judgment is past. Blessed be God. Hallelujah. I said the judgment is past. In Christ, the burning bush, the fire of the divine holiness did its double work. Amen. In Christ, the fire of the divine holiness did its double work. In Him, sin was condemned in the flesh. In Him, we are free. Takes a lot of working out on our side, but that's the way it is, folks. And until we know that, He who knew no sin became sin. He died that I might live. Is that right? You see, the double work, the double work of redemption was performed. In Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. That's enough to make somebody beside Brother Sutton shout. Amen. To know that. In Christ, 
we are free. In giving up his will to death, doing God's will, Christ sanctified himself, and in that will we are sanctified too. His crucifixion with its judgment of the flesh, his death with its entire putting off of what is of nature is not only for us, but is ours, a life, a power, working in us by the Holy Ghost right now. And God says, if you walk in the Spirit, I'll make that good in you. How many of you saved this morning? How many of you saved yourself? No, no. It was another power, wasn't it? This is what he's saying. As you yield that old nature up, amen, to the work that's already finished, and as you allow this life to work in you, it'll bring you to what you could never otherwise be. Thank God. Oh, day by day we abide in him. <coughs> Trembling but rejoicing, we take our stand in him for the power of holiness as judgment to vindicate within us its fierce vengeance against what is sin and flesh, so to let the power of holiness and redemption accomplish the glorious work. Recognizing that he's put to death all of this old self. Amen. Recognizing that. Yielding ourselves up. That he can make good all that Calvary did in us. Not holding on. Not worshiping at the, worshiping at the wrong shrine. But laying it all. Exposing ourselves to the cross. Where Paul said, I am crucified. But now I don't live, but Christ lives. That's the secret. That's the secret. Amen. My, my. And so the shout of salvation will ring ever deeper and deeper. Thank God. Truer and louder through our life. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like unto thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders? And then he says, Be ye holy. Be ye holy as I am holy. Hallelujah. That double work. He comes in. That which was separated, let me say it and close it. That which was separated to that Red Sea is united in every one of us in this place. That Egyptian's in your heart. That new man, that Israelite. Amen. They're united in you. And the work of his holiness is a double work. Judging, condemning, and destroying the Egyptian. Lifting up and glorifying the new creation. The same holiness, no difference. What is life to one is death to the other. What's light to one is darkness to the other. This is the way God says, walk ye in it. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and let's worship God. I would.